Welcome back to DXB Today, where one eye on the end of the year, New Year's resolutions, and to that end, big focus on our health, because a lot of people will take the opportunity at the start of a new year to swipe or wipe the, the slate clean and start again. Is that a good, a good reason to do so or otherwise? Well, let's find out with our next guest, because joining us now uh, is the head of the IVF department uh, and, of course, medical, medical director of fertility at the Dr. Suleiman Al Khabib Hospital, Dr. Behera El Gayushi, joining us live on the sofa. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm going to ask you the resolution question that we're asking everyone today as well, because yeah, a lot of people would say, OK, 1st of January, really, why not, you know, take on that resolution other parts of the year? But is it a good focus for people to have that sort of start of the new year, start a new habit, as it were? I really do think it's a good focus, even if you don't keep them. Uh, but it's a good habit to have, sort of like the new year, there's a new me, there's a new start. I'm going to start off with these things. Whether you achieve them or not, that's completely up to you. And they may change along the course of the year, but it's not a bad thing to have. Do you see an uptick in the number of uh, consultancies and, 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 and sessions that are, that are booked with you at the beginning of a new year? Oh wow, that's the peak time, January, <laughs> February, March, that first quarter of the year, it's sky high, it's a really good time. Okay. So Dr. Pohera, do you find that at the beginning of the year people actually try to get pregnant in terms of fertility or do they try and get healthy to have a healthy pregnancy? It really starts at the end of the previous year. So they're seeing you, they've got plans for holidays, they know they're going to go in excess during the Christmas time and the winter holidays. And so they are planning, they really are planning. So when I come in the new year, it's going to be a new me and a healthy me, and please help me to get pregnant, whether naturally or with assisted uh, technologies. But there really is a determination to do better. Mm. Yeah. Are you finding that more women are freezing their eggs now? I mean, I'm about to turn 40 next month, and I want to know, what, what should women who are reaching a new milestone, make a positive spin over there, <laughs> um, what should we be doing every year? Um, and also, for women who are entering their 40s, is, are freezing your eggs, is, is that something that you would recommend? You've touched on a point that's very close to my heart. Freezing eggs or fertility preservation for women. And it's usually for women who um, don't have a life partner with them or, or can't plan a family in the near future. And what it's a good option for reproductive uh, insurance policy for the future. And like any insurance policy, it may or may not pay out. You have to read the fine print. So what happens? You're, uh, you're born with a certain number of eggs. They go down during uh, your lifetime, beginning at 30, 35, and 40, they do drop. So if you do feel that the family's not on the horizon, in your 30s, you know, the early 30s is a really good time to consider freezing your eggs because you can delay having a family for however long you want. But if you don't have your eggs, then your chances of achieving a pregnancy, even through IVF, is very limited. So going back to your question, should I freeze my eggs or not? So uh, do you have a life partner? Are you planning more children? Is this the time to get a checkup about your fertility? A snapshot in time with a scan and a blood test. Where are you now? Should you be doing it? My advice to you is certainly look into it and seek advice of a fertility expert. Like me, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, can, you, can, you, can you recommend any? Yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's somebody I can tell you about. Uh, and um, have that check up, and then you can decide what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Incredible. So, okay, we're talking there about like egg freezing. Like in general, for health, have you got any tips for women like who want to also manage PMS, mood swings, all these things that I don't suffer from personally, you know. <laughs> uh, ask any man and they'll tell you. <laughs> no, I think my partner swings. would strongly yeah. disagree. So um, general lifestyle uh, advice is very important and it works wonders at any stage and any age. So eat healthy, mm -hmm. exercise, drink lots of water, quit the smoking and smoking includes vape, Icos, shisha, mm -hmm. everything, all of that is under the umbrella of smoking. And then also put a plan for your life. So I want to achieve a family by this stage, and if I haven't, then what do I need to do? Go by all means, have your hormones checked, have regular checks. We need to have smear checks or pap smears to just um, protect us against the cancer of the neck of the womb. We need to have mammograms and breast ultrasounds 
So we just get the checkups done there. Is, a, is there a positive family history? Should we be concerned about something which is in the family? So having general he uh, health checkups is really important. It's also important to know the background of your family as well, because that will take you in the right direction. Thank you so much, Doctor, for giving us an insight there into female health and also into egg freezing. So now Maitha went down to Adam Vital Hospital to meet orthopaedic and trauma surgeon Dr. Michael Weber to find out more about deformity corrections through limb lengthening and reconstruction. Let's take a look. We're here at the Adam Vital Hospital where we're about to meet Dr. Michael Weber, a surgeon who's developed a special technique for patients with bone defects and how to fix them. Let's go and find out more. I'm here with Professor Dr. Michael Weber, um, consultant orthopedic and trauma surgeon, and the creator of the Weber Cable Technique that helps treat patients with bone defects. How are you, Dr. Weber? I'm fine, how are you? Good, thanks. And I'm really interested in the Weber Cable Technique and how you use it to treat people with bone defects. Are these um, different bone uh, defects uh, treated? Yeah, they are treated with the Weber cable technique. Yeah, and let me show you how this works. I have a model here, and um, this is an external fixator. And um, <clears throat> this has here, you see the defect is here. There's the defect. Mm -hmm. And I want to pull this segment down with one millimeter a day. And this is uh, realized here with cables, which are going inside of the leg, coming outside here over these pulleys and are directed to these destructors. The body itself produces a tissue to heal the bone, like in every fracture. But this tissue is soft and can be destructed. So any defect, yeah, so with the time this goes down, 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 then it docks here, the bone will he heal here at the docking area, and here the patient has produced his own full quality bone. And looking at it, um, it looks like it might be a painful procedure, but you, but it isn't. It isn't, no. This transport is completely pain free because everything is inside and the patient won't feel it. Of course, he feels that you have a fixator outside because uh, the bone is fixed with pins and wires from outside through the skin to the bone. But after one week, they are walking and from the bone transport via Weber cable technique, they don't feel anything. Adam Vital Hospital is at the forefront of medical technology and Dr. Michael Weber has just given us an inside scoop on his own technique that has been changing lives. Big thanks to Maitha for that report as we continue our medical theme. And in fact, talking of that, let's find out what's up on the roundup with Tina. We're back to talking about artificial intelligence, but this time it's artificial intelligence therapy, which is essentially a complex and comprehensive use of data to aid a person on their journey to mental wellness. Guys, I'm gonna have to get your opinion on this. Of course, expect it. Now, do we trust AI to be our therapist? I'm thinking, no. <laughs> I'm thinking it makes it a lot more accessible to people and obviously a lot more affordable, but you lose your personal touch and could it be potentially dangerous? What are your opinions, Dr. Yeah, Shafali? I totally agree. I think that one of the things about therapy is actually human therapy. And you lose that connection, I think, when it's you know AI driven. Uh, you get to know somebody through and through on an emotional scale, on a you know mental well-being scale. And if that's gone, like two people can have exactly the same symptoms, but I would treat them differently depending on who they are. Would AI really get to know the difference between two different people on that level? Because priorities would change dependent on the person. And I just don't think we're there to be able to pick up that 
sort of nuance on those things. And aren't there a lot of visual cues that you tap into as a doctor? I mean, as a therapist, I've never done a session of therapy where the doc, whether it was online or in person, I feel like they're reading you. Tom, what are you thinking, right? <laughs> you want to say something, just say it. I don't, I'm, I'm fully in agree. I concur with you both. I concur with you uh, and both on, on this one. I think that, yeah, the, the, the one thing that AI lacks at the moment, I, don't, I think we all accept that AI has a huge role to play in medicine moving forward. Um, and it already is playing that role yeah. at the moment. But you're right, that bedside manner, that, that EQ, the emotional intelligence that doctors, therapists, uh, and, and other professionals bring to the table, that's the thing that it's missing at the moment. And that's where there's always gonna be that crossover. Yeah, I mean, I also think that, you know, in terms of, uh, it will get there, but we don't also just treat a bunch of data. That's the other thing. Like, yeah. you know, you could have the results in front of you, but the patient could be saying something that's totally different. That will change when and how I treat that patient. I'm not sure I'm gonna... I mean, I feel like I, I'm thinking of life coaching over here, which I know is something a lot of people are certified for, um, where I feel like in certain situations, AI therapy could be acceptable. But in situations where you're talking about someone's stability, whether they're having very serious like thoughts about their life and how they feel about it and you're really addressing their mental health and whether they feel stable i feel it's a really dangerous territory i am excited about the idea that therapy could be more affordable and accessible to people who can't access it at the moment so i hope that we get there what do you think amy i don't know i'm a bit of a emotional robot myself so maybe i'd get on with <laughs> ai as my therapist but no, I, honestly, I do. I agree with what you're saying. You know, um, I think there is a bridge there, having that empathy and being able to, you know, understand what's truly in front of you, which I don't, don't think AI is at right now. So yeah, I agree with what, what you guys are saying, definitely. Right, we are. Um, let us know your thoughts as well. Coming up, we discuss uh, gym training, uh, weight loss and sports activities and how to maintain your weight over the holidays. Plus, we've got highlights from the season that was, music in the studio. There's loads. Stay with us.